We're so happy that you've linked into Transforming Truth. The message you're about to hear is part of a new series that we are airing, and the series is called How God Works With You. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And as we look at the kingdom of God, we need to understand His word, yes. His works, yes. But a lot of people don't understand His ways, so they misunderstand what He says and what He's doing. So this series is gonna help you understand how God works with you. Open your Bible to Exodus chapter three. These are uh, familiar verses. Um, and I wanna bring you a message called Heaven's Redirect. Heaven's Redirect. Let's go back in time. Let's go to a very dry, barren, and lonely place. And let's meet an 80-year-old man there whose name you know. His name's Moses. He's 80. For 40 years, he's felt like a failure. He's living his life. He's married. He's got a couple of grown sons. But he's not in the place that he thought he, would, he was destined to be. But that didn't thwart the plan of God. So in Exodus chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible tells us of Moses, and it said he was keeping the flock of his father Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bushes burned, or not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then God said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and a broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, but I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I've sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will serve God on this mountain. Please take a seat this morning. This is a season in which many Christians are going to experience what I call a redirection from the Lord. I'm not talking about just people in their 20s and 30s who are embarking on their first direction. I'm talking about individuals in the body of Christ who have had in a direction, a trajectory, a plan, a pathway. They've been living on it. They may have assumed that this would be the plan until whatever stage of life they've been working towards comes, and, and then they'll enjoy that stage. So the plan that they've been living will give way to the last plan, which is typically in our retirement years and the whole American dream scenario and all of that. But, but here's what I'm prophesying today, and some of this is prophetic, that the Lord is right now in the business stirring what's in the pot, and he's going to be giving a redirect to some that are not in their 20s and 30s, but some that are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. Because Moses' example takes away every excuse that we have as to why God can't shift things in my life. 
And when we're looking at him, we don't need to say, oh no, Moses, why did you do that? I'm comfortable. I don't want a new assignment. We need to say, if the best assignment God has for me is tomorrow and from that point on, then I want that and I want it now. So we're looking at him. And I'm going to weave in a testimony of some others. In our church today are some, some friends of ours. They're part of the Newbridge family. I'm not going to give their names because it's not germane, but I will tell you that, that they're part of this assembly. Ten years ago, they were unbelievers. Ten years ago, the, the husband was a pretty aggressive agnostic. Um, he he, he kind of laughed at us and had seen enough of churchianity in all the parts of uh, America that he was just kind of, not kind of, he was committedly against it. And one day he was exposed to the gospel. Actually, he was exposed to some preaching. And in the midst of wanting to mock that preacher, he, he began to resonate. He said, well, I don't believe anything this guy is saying, but I do like the way he says it. And so he became acquainted with that man's ministry. And then as time went on, the gospel started getting into this man. And eventually, hearing a message on Romans chapter number 6, he opened up, uh, his eyes were opened up to the gospel by the Holy Spirit. He recognized his lostness. He repented of his sin. And he claimed Christ as his own Lord and personal Savior. He was radically saved. Not too terribly long after that, both he and his wife began to experience a move of God. And after uh, pursuing the Lord in the city that they lived in, they, 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 they came to a place years later where they were just frustrated by all that was lacking in the professing church. And so, lo and behold, they lived in another city over an hour away from here. And they decided, we're just going to drive up to Newbridge because something's happening there and we want to go there. And as that process went on, they, they then encountered in the last six months... Uh, the working of the Lord on their hearts and minds to the extent that the Lord said, I'm going to reassign you in life. Now, now these people are now empty nesters. They're in their 50s. Uh, the brother is getting close to 60. So they're not spring chickens. Forgive me, brother. Forgive me, sister. But they're in a place where they had every reason to say, we'll just keep it status quo. But pulsing in their heart was this move of the Lord that couldn't be defined with words. But they just knew that God was saying, why not now? Why not here? Why not? And they answered. And so they moved, sold their house, bought a new house, moved uh, a little north of here. And now they're saying, Lord, we're going to serve you in this new ministry that you've given us. And we're going to pour the rest of our years into what's next. It is a divine redirect that came and found a couple in their 60s, or 50s. And so when we think through this, what I want to do is I just want to take away the excuse of what a cool Bible story. No, friend. Yeah, maybe it's a cool Bible story, but it's a true Bible story, but it's also been duplicated time and time again. Why? Because God's never done with us. When he's done with you, you go to heaven. And the very fact that we're sitting here tells me he ain't done with you yet. And some of what he may have for you may be on the other side of a heavenly redirect where you thought you were going, what you thought you were doing, what you thought would be the rest of your life. And in wisdom and love, he says, no, that was a good plan you came up with, but it wasn't mine. I've got something better. So let's look at this and how it's exemplified in Moses' life. And um, let's be encouraged this morning. It all starts with what I call a divine in interruption. A divine interruption, verses 1 through 4. We see Moses living out his duty. D-U-T-Y, duty, in verse number one, it says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to the mountain of God. Uh, I remember reading this in the King James. I like that translation better. It's the backside of the desert. That, that just gives you a little bit more understanding. Now, when we're looking at Moses, he's, he's 80 years old. Acts chapter number 7 tells us that when Moses was 40, he had to flee Egypt. Moses had a call on his life. And at 40 years old, he was ready to make it happen. He was raised in the house of Pharaoh, but he himself was a Hebrew. And he believed that it was God's call, and it was, for him to deliver the Hebrew people. So Moses thought he'd do it one, one hammer blow at a time. And he killed an Egyptian that was beating a Hebrew. Bro, uh, Hebrew, and Moses knew that when he was, he was seen as the one who would deliver the people, that all the people would say, our deliverer is here, our redeemer is here, Moses will set us free. 
But when he killed the Egyptian, the next day he goes back to the similar place and it was two Hebrews fighting with each other and they called him out for the previous day's murder of the Egyptian and Moses panicked. Moses said, everybody knows I did this. And Moses, at 40 years old, became a fugitive. He moved forth towards Midian. He married a Midianite woman. And now Moses was living in a rocky, craggy, dry, ugly, lifeless place. He was there in Midian. And he was day in and day out watching over the flock for 40 years. I did the math, and it's like 16,500 days. What'd you do today, Moses? Well, I got sunburned. I led some stinky sheep. I cut my foot on a rock. What'd you do yesterday? Same thing. As a matter of fact, Moses could just write it out and pass out business cards. This is what I do. This is my life. If you can see that area of the world where he was living today, it looks like some of those shots that are taken on the landscape of Mars. It's just red, dry, dead, and ugly. And to make things worse, it's not only his, his, his location, but his vocation. I mean, he's 80 and he's working for his wife's dad. I mean, listen, this is a guy with a call on his life. This is a guy who was raised in Egypt in Pharaoh's household and would have been exposed to the greatest education, the greatest of culture, the greatest of art. He would have had all of the fineries. He would have had all of that, but for 40 years he's been living among stinky, smelly sheep, knowing that he blew it 40 years earlier when he tried to do God's work before God was ready to do it. See, my friends, when we think about that kind of stuff, it, it puts some things in perspective. Uh, Moses' sin 40 years earlier was basically the sin of haste. It was that he wanted to do God's will so badly God had given him some level, we don't find it written out in Scripture, but Moses knew inherently that God wanted him to deliver the people of Israel. And so what Moses did is he was just premature. Somebody once said that when one blow is struck, when the time is right, is worth a thousand blows struck in premature zeal. So it's not only about doing the right thing, it's about doing the right thing at the right time. And Moses had 40 years, 40 hard years to learn that lesson. And all his life was, was duty. Just taking care of sheep. He was domesticated, working for his father-in-law. We go down into verse 2 and we see, though, God wasn't thwarted by that. God wasn't intimidated by Moses' mundane, uneventful life. So in verse number 2, the Bible says that the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. It's a shrub. And he looked, Moses did, and he beheld, he studied it, he looked, and the bush wasn't burning, or it was burning, but it was not consumed. And so Moses is walking out. There was nothing on his calendar that day. When his iPhone alarm went off that morning, did not say, today's your day, Moses. There was no indication whatsoever that this day would have been any different than the day before. So he's doing the same thing, and yet what Moses didn't know is God had a divine moment where he says, now is the time. And so God moves toward Moses, and what we see there, the angel of the Lord, by the way, if you're new to your Bible, is often a representation. It's a phrase that represents the actual presence of the Lord. You have to let the context determine whether it's actually the Lord or one of his angels. In this case, we find out it's actually the Lord. The Lord is coming to Moses, and he is igniting supernaturally this shrub. The shrub is on fire, but the shrub does not burn up. It's burning but not burned out. And so Moses notices this thing, and, and God takes this unique event, this slight nudge out of the ordinary, this thing that broke the monotony of 16,500 monotonous days in a row, and yet God just throws one simple little uh, caveat, one, one variable in the midst of it, and Moses is captivated. He gets his attention. One of the things that I found myself praying this morning as I was pondering this message was, Lord, I'm not sure if we're not such a locked-in generation that we would even give a second glance to a burning bush you send in our life. And I believe he's doing it. Matter of fact, I'll go so far as to, to say to all of us what we saw this morning, just breaking out of the norm, breaking out of the routine during worship and people coming forward and, and God orchestrating all of that. None of that was scripted. Dustin came over to me right before and he says, I got a word and I go, brother, do it. And, and so what we see is the Lord saying, I'm going to do something different. Let's see who notices anything. And so when Moses is experiencing this thing, God's getting his attention. He does that still. 
Ask God for clarity and discernment and the ability to trace his hand, to see what he's doing. And for the glory of the Lord, pry your eyes. Lift up your eyes off of all the have-tos in your life. I have to do that too. And, and, and just recognize that a loving father doesn't leave us alone. He, he, he doesn't just say, okay, I got you started. You take care of life. We'll catch up when you get to glory. But because he loves us and because he has the ability, he's constantly working for you. He's working in you. He's working around you. All in the hopes that he can work through you in greater levels. And so in verse number three, we see Moses makes a determination. Moses said, and this is the most important verse in these 12 verses. Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight. Why the bush is not burned. If if there isn't a verse number three, there isn't the rest of the book of Exodus. If Moses doesn't break out of the routine. See, God set him up. But it was Moses who said within himself, I'm going to explore this thing. There's something unique happening. I don't understand what I see before my eyes. I don't understand. I can't explain what my senses are receiving. But this is unusual. And so he left enough room in the midst of his have-tos for a couple of might-bes. I don't know where all of us are this morning. But if you've lost your hope for a might be. If, if you've bought into the idea that your life is going to remain at the current level of significance, I'm going to lovingly challenge you to request an uptick, an elevation in your expectation. Because I believe what's coming in, in the United States of America, what God is offering to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe it is going to be accompanied by um, an endowment for those who have an expectation to receive. Now, put up your pocketbook. I'm not talking about cha-ching. I'm talking about something far greater than that. I'm talking about the Lord saying, who wants to move where I move? Who wants to go where I'm going? Who wants to do what I am doing? Who wants to say what I am saying? Who wants to hear what I am hearing? I, and I will too, Taylor. I, I believe that part of the heart of the Father is that he is literally, and I do believe it's a distinct work for this season. I don't believe that 25 years ago that this level of it was being offered. And the reason why I believe it so strongly now is because we see a convergence of evil in the world, which is indicative of the fact that the enemy is ratcheting up his attack and his strategy. He is ratcheting it up. And God is never one to just sit back and say, well, look at what the devil's doing. And the Lord's already won the victory. So if Satan thinks he's going to, to, to influence and go and uptick, the Lord's going to shot block that thing in a heartbeat. But how does he do it? He does it through people that have an elevated expectation and will say, God, here am I. I want to be used. I want to be a part of what you are doing, Father. And so if that's going to happen, let me tell you what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to get a little brother Moses in us. And that means we're going to have to turn aside from the have-tos to explore the what might be's. You know, I think of Walker and Katie, and uh, we, we got to spend a little time with them and a couple, of, well, about 100 of their friends on Friday night. And, and, and as Walker and Katie, uh, you know, in their 30s, are approaching a brand new season of life and, and moving from a, a, a flourishing ministry of influence here and going into the unknown in St. Louis to go back home with, with four kids and one on the way, five kids and one on the way, four kids and one on the way. I just always say they got about nine kids, and that covers it all. <laughs> I don't prophesy that, but I, I, I jokingly say that. But they're, they're moving up to St. Louis, and, and he's going to go into a, a ministry that he's never been, done before. What's he doing? In the middle of all of his have-tos, in the middle of all of Katie's have-tos, they're saying, yeah, but, but we believe this might be. And as much as we hate to lose them, and I do, I hate it, I rejoice that they, they saw a burning bush, and they said, we've got to explore this, and it turns out the Lord's in the midst of it. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that's perfectly normal to rejoice in that. But it's not just that couple I mentioned earlier. It's not just Walker and Katie. Friends, listen, he doesn't even have to reassign your geography to do what I'm talking about. Matter of fact, for most of you, it won't be a reassignment of geography, but it'll be a a shift in what you perceive him doing. So in verse number four, here's what Moses discovered when he turned aside. You see, Moses considered the moment, and here God consecrates the moment. Look at his discovery, verse four. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, 
God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, note the wording. God had not said a word to Moses until his infinite eyes saw that Moses was exploring what God was doing. And as soon as, literally in the Hebrew it indicates, in the moment that Moses broke away from the half-twos and started exploring what he was seeing before him, in that very moment he hears the voice of God, probably for the first time in 40 years. He heard the voice of the Lord, and the first thing that he hears the Lord saying is his own name, Moses, Moses. It's a beautiful moment. I've never heard the audible voice of God. I've met credible friends who say they have. I've never had that experience before. If the Lord ever wants to do it, I want to do it. But up to this point, I've not heard the voice of the Lord. But believe me, I don't feel cheated because I've still heard the Lord. I just haven't heard his voice. Everybody thinks he's probably got, you know, the deep voice. (laughs) Moses, Moses. I always like to suggest he might be an Irish tenor. You have no idea. You just never know doesn't matter what the voice sounds like it is the voice of God and he calls Moses and when he calls his name it it, it communicates two things to Moses Moses I know who you are I haven't forgotten and Moses I know where you are I've always had my eye on you so when the Lord begins to speak when you turn aside you find out especially remember where he is he's dry he's worn out he's in the midst of the mundane he doesn't really have a killer job he's working for his father-in-law I'm thinking how old is his father-in-law Moses is 80 he doesn't even have his own flock. I mean, he, he's a, he's a farmhand at 80 years old, this guy. And so in the midst of all of that, the Lord says, I never took my eye off of you. See, some of you are in the midst of seasons that the enemy whispers to you that are going to perpetuate themselves in, uh, without end. The enemy says, this is the way it's always going to be. And you're in a tough season. You're in a season with more question marks than exclamation points. You're in a season where you don't know the end game. And and you're saying it's been a long time, but you're still in the midst of that season. And the enemy likes to tell you he's forgotten about you or he's given up on you, especially if you've got a failure in your history like Moses did. Moses is a fugitive. Moses is wanted for murder in the very place that God's about to send him back to. And, And so he has got a total history, and that is fertile ground for the enemy to tell you how messed up your life is and how how long it's going to remain that way. But the Lord just busts in. He says, Moses, I know who you are, I know where you are. Moses, Moses. So go down, down, go down with me into verse number five. God's going to reintroduce himself to Moses in this devout introduction. First of all, Moses, meet the God of holiness. God has called his name. Moses had not been forgotten. And then God says, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I actually think I mentioned this last week. The first time you find the word holy in the English Bible is right here. And it's given in the context of a human being possibly attempting to approach God on his or her own. Now, God is welcoming, and God is gracious, and God is loving, and he is kind, but he also is holy. Not that that's in uh, juxtaposition to all those other attributes. It's not. But the one thing the Lord wants to know is, Moses, this is no casual moment between me and you. Moses, it's not that the ground, the the parcel of, of ground he was standing on was holy. It's not even that the bush is holy. It's that the moment is holy. It's a holy moment, and he says, Moses, I don't want anything between me and you. Take the sandals off. This is holy ground, and it's holy because God consecrated that moment. Um, I, I do believe in this, and let me, let, me, let me try to teach this and not just shout it. I, I, was, trained, I, I, I was trained theologically and very conservative cessationist um, circles and cessationism is just simply a term that describes those that do do not believe that the ongoing supernatural work of the holy spirit is for today and so i was trained and even proclaimed and preached myself to diminish the significance of a personal experience with god I was trained, just go to the Word, read about God, and, and I did for years and years, and I loved Him, and, and, and it was awesome in, in many ways. But then there came a point where my incessant Bible studies couldn't fill the longing of my heart, and, and I wanted to know Him experientially. I, I wanted to, as Jacob did, I wanted to wrestle with God. I wanted a close contact. 
And so I began to pray in those years. This would have been in the late 90s. I began to pray, Father, I, I know there's more. I love your word. I still do to this day. But Lord, I, I've been telling people that they shouldn't expect to feel you, but I can't support that with the very Bible that I say I believe. Lord, I've been telling people not to seek experience with you because, Lord, we seem to have more confidence in the, the enemy's ability to deceive us than your ability to connect with us legitimately. I mean, do you, do you realize that? How many of us were told, you know, don't go after the Holy Spirit. You might, gotta, you might get a, a, de a demon, a, a wicked spirit, an evil spirit. So we actually come to this theological place where we have more confidence in the enemy to deceive us than God to bless us. And so when all of that was going on, I just got to this place where I said, Lord, I've, I've, I've got to know you. I, I've, I've, it's got to be personal to me. And it, it was a little bit of a season, and then I don't have time to go into all the details, but, but God honored that broken hunger. This is an experience with, with Moses and the Lord. I'm going to say this maybe to cultivate some hunger, to serve as a catalyst. Some of you have beautiful, brilliant theology. And you should and you must. We should know God objectively by how he reveals himself to us in his word. But the Father just doesn't want you only to read his book. He actually wants relationship with you. He feels for you. He wants you to feel him. He loves you, not just theologically, but personally and passionately. And in and, 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 and a sense of that, that there's something actually happening between you and him. And he wants you to experience the other side of that. And so for Moses, God didn't have to do all of this. There's a thousand different ways God could have gotten Moses to Egypt. But he came to Moses personally and said, Moses, this moment between us is a fresh start. He said, Moses, go ahead, slip off the sandal, son. This is holy ground. I never want you to forget this. And here we are thousands of years later talking about it. Well, it's not just that God wanted Moses to know he was holy, but God wanted Moses to know that he was the God of hope. He uses this statement, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Those are covenant names. Moses, when he hears those names, immediately his Jewishness begins to percolate. That covenant was for the Hebrews. Moses was a Hebrew. He was raised like an Egyptian. As a matter of fact, when he met uh, his wife, Zipporah, the first time they met, she went back to his father, his future father-in-law, and said, hey, an Egyptian set us free from the shepherds. By the way, let me just say this. The deliverer was still in Moses. He had failed in Egypt. He wasn't going to deliver Israel from Egypt in that season, but he still had the delivering call. And so what did he do? He delivered Zipporah, his wife, from some mean shepherds around a well. Listen, you can't get away from the way God's wired you. I mean, he just made you on purpose, and it's a beautiful thing that he made. You don't need to copy anybody else. You don't need to deny how he's made you. you. You and I need to be refined, and we need to mature, and we need to submit ourselves unto the Lord and the greater good of the body. But he made you how he made you, so don't waste it by trying to become somebody else. Yeah, that was for free. It didn't cost you nothing extra. It wasn't in the notes. The point being is this. So I don't even remember what I was saying. Help me, Holy Spirit. Hope, thank you. Yeah, the God of the covenant. I got from Abraham to Zipporah. Nobody's ever done that before. Um, so is that this, this covenant comes up. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, Moses, I haven't forgotten my promise I made to my people. And that means, Moses, you aren't forgotten either. And so though hope was delayed, it wasn't denied. And so in those words, God's saying, Moses, my covenant stands sure. Now, he's going, to go, he's going to unpack it a little bit further. Before he does so, verse number six, at the end of it, M Moses had to meet the God of humbling. The Bible says that Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. So in that moment, the bush is on fire. Mo all Moses has said in this whole conversation is, I'm right here. Here I am. And all the Lord is, after he called Moses' name twice, Moses said, I'm here. And, and from the bush... In the flame, he hears the voice of the Almighty saying, I'm God. And Moses is humbled. He's afraid to look upon God. The awe of the moment results not in Moses bowing up, not in Moses saying, where you been for 40 years? 
Not in Moses running away, terrified. Moses has been running his whole life. He's now 80. He's not going to run anymore. He's going to squirm, but he's not going to run. And so Moses was afraid to look upon God. What's so amazing, it's not how we begin, it's how we finish. Moses began afraid to look upon the presence of the Lord, this God that was pursuing him, this God that was coming after him. This God who was working in supernatural ways in Moses' life. Moses had no grid for the supernatural. We read nothing in his early life that indicates that there would have been the supernatural activity of God. But here he is at 80 years old, and God is bringing him something supernatural. And, and Moses, at this point, starts off like a lot of us did, overwhelmed, afraid. What does this mean? So he doesn't look on God. But by the time you go another 40 years into the future... <laughs> Moses is in Exodus 33 saying, there's only one thing I want. I want to see your glory. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. I want more of you. I want more of you. I want more of you. Isn't that beautiful? You see, my friends, if you don't get it yet, that's okay. If you keep pressing the Lord, you'll get whatever he wants you to get. And the heartbeat that you'll end up with is more of you. More of you. God said, God actually said, Moses, you're, you're kind of, you're, you're out punning your prayers here, son. You, you, you can't see my glory and live. You, you just can't see my glory live, but I'll show you a little bit of it. And, and what Moses was able to see transformed him. You know, friends, I, I'm pastoring you right here. Myself, Dustin, so many of the leaders and others in, in this assembly, we're not looking to have a hip-hollering good time. That's not our goal. I want to celebrate Jesus, but there's going to be days where it's a solemn assembly. We're going to gather in here this Friday night at the uh, Friday night regional worships. And we, worship nights, we hold those events once a month. My friend Taylor Harris up here on the front row, who's just such a blessing to this body of believers. He, he just had this call of God, never done anything like this before, didn't know what to do. But it was a redirect in his life just a couple of years ago. And God started saying, I'm going to use you for this. And now I'm, I'm praying for a couple of hundred people this coming Friday. What do you do, Jeff? We come in and we press into the Lord and we literally, we're looking to see how the bush is going to burn. What's he going to do? There hasn't been a single one of these regionals where somebody hasn't been healed. Not a single one of them where somebody hasn't been healed. Yeah, that's actually a good thing. That's like a really, really good thing. There have been deliverances. There have been breakthrough. I'm going to tell you the last time I went to one, I got rocked. And, and all of that's great. But the point being is this. It's an opportunity to turn aside and see what God is doing. To break off from the norm. And so Moses was afraid to look upon the Lord, but ended up being the guy saying, show me everything I can take and live. I think that's you. I think if, if, if you'll just begin to say, I know where I am today, Lord. I know where I am today, Father. I, I know that, and, and God help us, there's been so much silliness attributed to the Holy Spirit and the work of the Lord. We've all seen the, the extremes, but do you know how the devil le uses that? The devil actually holds the counterfeit in front of your face to keep you from pursuing the genuine. He, he literally says, there is no genuine here, see? And he puts the counterfeit in front of you. Friends, there's been counterfeit money since you were born, but you still want your paycheck on Friday, don't you? <laughs> you're, you're not going to say, well, there's no such thing as real money because all the counterfeit money. We, we, we don't do that in other areas, but when it comes to the activity of the Lord, we say, too much counterfeit, too much nonsense, too much, listen, that's not a real burning bush. That's somebody with a torch, and they're behind a curtain, and, and it's just smoke and mirrors. I'm going to tell you something. Let's just say that half of it isn't real what about the half that is do you think god is going to prevent the hungry those seeking his presence those wanting to make contact with him in an experiential way do you think he's going to deny them absolutely not and hallelujah we have the holy spirit and he can teach us what's wrong and what's right but don't let the existence of a counterfeit in the spiritual realm keep you from the genuine. Press in. He's good. Taste and see. Amen. Verses 7 and 8. I'm actually trying to hurry. Here's the determined intervention. Now, this is where it gets good. And this is for some of you that are living in the lowlands right now and struggling. And you, you feel forgotten. God's going to talk to a man who felt forgotten about an entire nation of people that felt forgotten. And this determined intervention, verse 7. Look at what God had discerned. Then the Lord said, I've surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, 
and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. He said, I know their sufferings. So it's, it's been 400 years, 400 years that Israel has been enslaved by the Egyptians. It's very interesting to me. I just went and read chapters 1 and 2 again this morning to be refreshed in Exodus. And do you know when the enemy started making the Hebrews slaves? They weren't slaves when they first got down there. Do you know when the enemy, when Pharaoh and his people started making the Israelites slaves? It was when they were growing in power. And the enemy got afraid. And, and Pharaoh said, oh, uh, the Hebrews are multiplying. They're going to be too strong from us. Before this gets aw- uh, away from us, let's go ahead and let's enslave them. That happens a lot now. The enemy sees the touch of God on your life. He sees you migrating towards breakthrough. You're about to have encounter. You're about to be filled with the Spirit. You're about to be baptized in the Spirit. You're about to start experiencing revelatory gifts, prophetic words, words of knowledge, words of wisdom. You're about to start moving more deeply into the calling that God has for you. And the enemy sees it, and so he pulls out his big guns on you because he prefers you remain a slave to something lesser. And so that's what was happening to Egypt. And so for 400 years, they had been slaves. But God, in his divine intervention, had said, enough is enough. Moses, now you're ready. You're not the 40-year-old anymore who thought he was going to go in there as the, the, you know, the kingdom come kid and going to make stuff happen. But 40 years in the desert, under the heat, to learn you're a nobody apart from God, that was a school of its own. Moses had gotten a PhD in brokenness in the desert. And that made him the perfect candidate for God to use. So now he's sending them back. But listen to this. God said, I have seen their affliction. He saw it the whole time. He said, I've heard their cries. He heard every single lament of the Hebrews. And he said, I know their sufferings. What does that tell you about the Father? It tells you that he's personally connected to us as his people. That he's not up there with his arms, omnipotent arms, folded across his immeasurable chest, saying, I don't care what happens to them. My my plan's set in effect. Look, listen, he is listening. He's watching. And he understands. Now, the question that might arise is, well, why doesn't he do something sooner? Well, Isaiah answered that for us when he said that God's ways are not like our ways. God's ways are higher than our ways. As the heavens are high above the earth, so are God's ways higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher than his thoughts. When basically what that is, is it's a gentle, shh, don't ask questions that you can't understand. It means that we don't live by God defending himself. We live by our trust in him. And so the time came that Israel would no longer be bound up. And so look at what God had determined in verse number 8. He says, I have come down. He's talking to Moses. I mean, that's a pretty interesting statement. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land flowing with milk and honey. God said, Moses, I'm not up there. I'm right here. I have come come down in order to bring them up you know that's the way the lord does that's calvary in a in a nutshell for you that's the cross of jesus christ in a nutshell who can ascend of the to the father's uh heavens who who none of us can climb our way earn our way work our way to the father and so if we were ever going to be with the father which was his delight he had to come down and so god came down in the person of the lord jesus christ god became man in order to live among us as a fellow human being, tempted in all points as we are tempted, yet he without sin. And he who was righteous, he who knew no sin, became sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. So in other words, the Father moves down towards us in order to bring us up to him. And so that's what God did for them. And I want to go go ahead and just be bold with you. I, I understand what it feels like to be, to feel like God has forgotten I'm not up here saying I've never wrestled with it. I mean, there, there was a season in my life, a long one, where I kept praying, but I, I didn't pray with any expectation that things were going to change because they hadn't changed the year before or the year before that or the year before that. Well, Israel would look at me and say, yeah, we waited 400. 400. See, he's never hasty. He's never in a rush. And when we're becoming like him, listen to this, When we are becoming like God, we will never be given to rushing from one thing to another. Part of your maturity in Jesus as you start 
displaying a patient desire to receive. It doesn't mean you're passive. It just means you're patient. And so God is now saying, now is the time. Moses, you struck a blow 40 years ago in your hasty zeal that led to nothing. I'm about to strike one blow, and it's going to lead to the deliverance of my people. So the last three verses, thank you for being patient. God wasn't going to do it without Moses. It was a delicate initiation. I mean, listen, it sounds great for the Lord to say, hey, that which has been needed for so long, I'm about to, I'm going to put a touch of breakthrough grace on it. It's about to happen. We say, do it, Lord. He says, I am. I'm going to do it with you. <laughs> he says, we're going to do it. And Moses didn't initially like that plan. So God had to get delicate and initiate with Moses. I believe he's doing that this morning with some in the room. Moses, I want you to receive my passion, verse number 9. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I've seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Now, that was the heart of the father. The father was saying, Moses, my children are there in Egypt, I have watched the cruelty been done to them for successive generations. Their cry has reached a climax now. And Moses, I am about to do something. And what he is doing in this, this is the nature of any call that God gives. Hear me on this. The nature of a calling from God is that he takes some of his passion for something and he puts it in you. And that passion is like holy leaven. He just puts a little bit in, a, in you, but then Jeremiah would say it this way. Yeah, even if I wanted to quit, I couldn't because it became fire in my bones. So the, the, the bush that was burning is, is going to become Moses that's burning. Moses is going to burn with the presence of God. Hallelujah. And friends, this is, this is, hear me on this. Lord, help me. Help me articulate this, Father. Some of you have a calling. You literally have a calling from God, but you got hamstrung in it because you got all tied up in the twisty knots of, is that me or is that God? Is that me or is that God? Is that me or is that God? Well, let me just ask you this. Let's just say it was you. Is it consistent with God's character? Is it consistent with his mission? Do you believe God's passionate about it? Then friends, don't wait in the sense of just for 10, 15, 20 years just saying, well, I still haven't figured out if it's God or if it's me. You know, patience and procrastination they're like inbred cousins, okay? I mean, it's just, it's, they're, they're, they're so close to each other, but procrastination, set it aside. Patience is good, but listen, procrastination, it kills a thousand callings. Moses, I'm really passionate. This is what I'm doing in the earth right now. I'm going to give you some of that. I've seen their cry. Or excuse me, I've heard their cry. I want you to hear it. I've seen their oppression of their taskmasters. I want you to see it. Child of God, 21st century follower of Jesus Christ, here's what I'm doing in the world. I'm bringing a giant of a revival that's going to stand. Ten years ago, there was a prophecy given. Actually, it was seven years ago. There was a prophetic word given that actually began in time last night in Cleveland, Ohio. The prophetic word was a vision that was given to a prophet in Kansas City. And this word involved a Gulliver-like giant laying across from the Midwest down to Atlanta. And the head was in Cleveland. And this giant began to rise up. And his arms were touching a couple of cities. And his feet were, were originally laying as he was laying on his back in a couple of cities. It was Cleveland, Philadelphia as mentioned, Charleston, North Carolina was mentioned. Um, a couple of other cities, maybe in Columbus, Ohio. But ultimately, when the giant, this revival giant, stood in the prophetic vision, both of his feet stepped into Atlanta. Wow. Last night in Cleveland, Lou Engle gathered, uh, I don't know how many people, thousands of people in the same building where the Cavaliers uh, play basketball. And in that arena, Quicken, Quicken Arena, in that arena, thousands were gathering, calling out and fasting in prayer. Thousands of leaders also from all around America were calling out for this giant of revival to awaken. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm not even asking. It's coming. 
it's coming. And it's coming to your city. And it's not coming to leave your city. It's coming to stand in Atlanta. God is doing something in this region. And so the Lord is saying this to us. He's saying, I want you to be passionate about what I'm passionate about. I'm merging again. I'm remarrying word and spirit. You don't have to pick and choose anymore. You don't have to pick either a charismatic church or a church that believes in the Bible. God's saying, I'm blowing out the doors on denominationalism. I'm tearing that kind of human-made stuff away. And I'm bringing together people who love me and honor my word and I'm going to do something through those vessels that is going to happen and it's going to happen here it's going to happen in your generation your kids are going to drink from that cup your grandkids are going to drink from that cup we're going to be able to step into that I'm going to tell you something on the back end of what God is worship team come on up here I'm done with the sermon on the back end of what the Lord is doing we're going to see miracles break forth there's not going to be any questioning there's not going to be any wonder there's not going to be any committee meetings it's not going to be people saying I don't know if this is real I don't know it's not it's going to move in such a dramatic and undeniable fashion that when we see it we will know that it has come so what do we do father impart your passion to me father I'm going to pray into what you're speaking father I'm going to turn aside from all of my have to's and I'm going to step into the might be's I'm going to say Lord if you're going to be setting bushes on fire in my life Lord give me eyes to see because I don't want to miss anything that you're doing in my generation